What you see right here are two developing eggs of an arachnid in the family Theraphosidae, otherwise known as the tarantula. Now, tarantulas are spiders, and spiders are arthropods. And arthropods are built out of little Lego block segments that often repeat like a centipede do. And look at that. You can see the segments right there. It's all rolled up in a ball, but if you unrolled it, it looks a bit like a pug version of a centipede. All the segments in the back will fuse together to form the big butt part of the spider. All the front segments also fuse together and become very leggy. But right now, this one's almost ready to hatch. You can see little fangs. And look, he's not even born yet, and he has a five o'clock shadow. When they hatch, these little babies are tiny. Eggs with legs is what they call them. They're very cute. I mean, look at the one on the left. It's got straight up puppy dog eyes. These babies have a lot of growing to do, but for a tarantula, growing is a whole thing. They wear their skeletons on the outside, fashion choice. The skeletons don't really grow, so if they want to get bigger, they have to make a whole new one. Here, let's watch a grown up one do it. Now it does look a bit dead, but what's happening is that it's grown a whole new version of what you see right there underneath what you see right there. And now it's time to wriggle out of the old hairy onesie. After it's loosened up a bit, the tarantula uses its new legs to push off its old body. And look at all that stuff it had to rebuild, all the way down to those little hairs. And just to make it confusing, they're not even called hairs, they're called seti. And they can do all sorts of things, you'll see. After the mold's done, it must feel a little weird, walking away from essentially your corpse. And of course, the way they walk is a whole thing. They have an open circulatory system. Basically, the tubes that come out the heart just end and dump blood into different parts of the body cavity. Blood goes back into the heart through slits on the heart itself. So their bodies are sort of like a blood-filled demon stress ball. And that's sort of how they move. They squeeze blood into their legs to extend them. And then they use muscles to pull them back. A dead tarantula has no blood pressure, so its legs curl in. Now at the end of their feet, they got little claws. And they use them to climb on rough surfaces. But look at that, they can also climb on glass. So it turns out they have these little hairy pads on their feet. And if you look close, they're like little feathers designed to spread out and make close contact with the microstructure of a surface. The close contact creates tiny little attractive forces called van der Waals forces. And if you add up a whole bunch of those tiny forces, you can hold on. And you don't need any glue. It's called dry adhesion. But here's the thing. When tarantulas walk on glass, they leave behind these little goopy footprints. Doesn't look that dry to me. And of course, the science hippies can't leave something like that alone. One team found silk in the footprints, and they found these little things with holes in them on their feet. So they said that must be where the silk comes from. And so they published a paper saying that tarantulas cling to smooth surfaces by secreting silk from their feet. Some other scientists were like, hold on, there's silk everywhere. How do you know they didn't just step in some ordinary butt silk and were walking around with it stuck to their shoe like toilet paper? The second team covered a tarantula's butt with wax, so there wasn't any stray silk. When they redid the experiment, there was no silk in the footprints. And so they published a paper saying that tarantulas do not shoot silk from their legs. Burn. And another group found that those seti with holes in them were actually fluid-filled tubes used to sample and sense chemicals. So the footprints are sort of like leftovers from licking the ground. The tarantula was fine. They washed it off with a bit of warm water. So tarantula's feet may not make silk, but their back bits certainly do. And they're out there tippy-tapping all over the place. They live in these burrows that they line with silk. Sometimes it's a little hidey hole in the ground, and sometimes it's up in a tree. The silk they make isn't the sticky kind, but all those threads that they leave outside their burrow are sort of an extension of their senses. They got little hair things on their legs that can sense tiny vibrations, so they can tell if something's snooping around. Well, <laughs> not that time. Tarantulas are ambush hunters. They can grab with their front legs and then hold on with these little arm-like things called pedipalps. Now right next to their mouth, they've got a stubby little pair of limbs called the chelicerae. And that's where the fangs are, and the fangs probably evolved from claws. So the fangs are more like if you had little T-Rex hands with teeth for fingers on either side of your mouth hole. These fangs are hollow and connected to a venom gland that delivers, well, venom. This venom both paralyzes prey and begins to digest them from the inside. Now the fangs don't just puncture, you can see them right here sort of squeezing. The side of the chelicerae opposite the fangs is lined with little teeth-like structures that help crush the prey, like a little nutcracker. Ooh, that's nasty. This is important because spiders forgot to evolve a mouth that can chew. They just have a narrow tube connected to a sucking stomach, which acts a bit like the bulb end of a pipette. Tarantulas are essentially on a liquid diet and have to puree their food and even strain it through special straining hairs to get rid of the chunks. 
They often wrap their prey up in silk, which can be a bit of an awkward pirouette if the food's up front and the silk comes out the back. It's not easy, and some of the things they eat are big, like this one got a baby possum. You try making silk pajamas for a possum. Oh look, it's time for mating. This is Clarence, and he's going to show you how he makes his sperm web. While he's setting it up, let me explain. Spiders evolved from arthropods that lived in the water. If you live in the water, you don't have to worry about your sperm drying out. You can just let your sperms and eggs float around and make babies. But when they came on land, they had to figure out how to get the sperms over to the females. So evolution said, I have an idea. So male spiders evolved a special organ on their second pair of limbs. These palpal bulbs are often hidden because they're tucked back and under. You can see one right there peeking out a bit. If you flip them forward, you can get a better view. Inside, it's quite complex. And it takes a number of molts before all the parts are formed and in the right places. It's essentially a long coiled up tube inside of a very specific shape that's different for each species. It has to be bendy and stiff in just the right places to work. Now here's the problem. The place where the sperm comes out is not near these bulbs. And in fact, it's out of reach. Seems like a pretty big oversight. But this is where Clarence's little nappy comes in. It's pretty ingenious. First, he separates a bit from the ground and then climbs underneath so he's upside down. Then he turns around. It's a bit awkward. He has another pair of little spinnerets behind the big ones, and he uses them to weave a tiny little patch of special silk. It's onto this patch that he deposits sperm, so the sperm sort of hangs down like a little goober. Then he climbs back on top of the web, and then alternately sticks his little hand bulbs into the sperm ball. Capillary action pulls sperm up into the tubes. Once his palpal bulbs are loaded with the sperms, the male is ready for a night out on the town. He leaves the safety of his burrow in search of a female. But females like to stay in on the weekends, have some me time. So the male has to do a sort of trick-or-treat version of dating, where you wander around and knock on doors hoping to get lucky. Oops, that's another male. The problem with all of this is that it leaves the male tarantula very vulnerable. He is snack size for quite a few animals and has a nice little crunch to him. Luckily, he isn't completely defenseless. He's got the fangs and a defensive posture designed to show them off. But remember, they have hairs for everything, so of course there's some special defensive hairs. Some species have these patches of stridulating seti. By rubbing them together, they can make a hissing noise. That's a noisy, not-so-patient spider right there. No judgment. I mean, have you ever been accosted by a microphone the size of your upper body? You might make that sound, too. Some of the New World tarantulas also have urticating seti. These seti are barbed and designed to break off fairly easily. Often the way they break leaves one end with a tip that looks just like a hypodermic needle. They are designed to work themselves down and into a surface on contact. And let me tell you, if these urticating hairs get on your skin or in your eyes or on your mucous membranes, they can really hurt. Some tarantulas will rapidly rub these seti patches when they are threatened, sending out a little cloud of these hairs. But despite all of this, they still have a serious issue with one predator in particular. It is called the tarantula hawk, a name which is a lot less frightening than what it is, which is a wasp. But imagine a wasp that compared to you is roughly the size of a dog. And you know what this wasp does? It goes searching around in tarantula burrows or just waits for them to come out and then tries to sting them through the soft patch on their belly. Look at this one, he flipped right on his back like some jujitsu specialist. Oh, there it goes. If the wasp finds an opening, all it takes is a moment. The sting delivers a venom that paralyzes the tarantula. The wasp then drags the tarantula about looking for a suitable spot where it will pause and then lay its eggs on top of the tarantula's body. Then the wasp buries it, often alive, and the wasp babies eat the tarantula. It's horrifying. Once the male finds a burrow with a potential mate, he has to convince the female to come out. Now, it might not look like much, but this is sort of like an upside-down version of the balcony scene from Romeo and Juliet. Here, you can see it a bit better in these cutaway diorama versions. See all that tapping? Well, they're flirting by Morse code, using vibrations. Now, it goes on like this until she stops responding or she comes out of the burrow. Which can be terrifying. <laughs> you know, she shows up at the door and she's heavily armed. <laughs> ah! Run away! <laughs> but if all goes well, this gives the tarantulas a chance to feel each other out. Literally. It's kind of cute. Now, all this closeness does start to force the issue of the whole fangs thing. Male tarantulas have spurs on their front pair of legs. 
One of the first moves he has to pull off is to get those spurs underneath the female's fangs. Once he has his spurs in place and her fangs are firmly secured, he lifts her up and begins to explore her underside with his spermed up palps. The female has two small openings that lead to her spermatheci, organs that store sperm until the female is ready to lay her eggs. Here's what the spermatheci look like from the inside. Think of them like little pockets. Spermatheci come in all sorts of shapes. This one looks like a drowning snail. Here's a happy frog. Two pigs in a hot tub that just had an argument. Or a gummy bear that just wants to hide under the covers. The male's palpable bulb is just the right shape to put sperm into these little pockets. Now, people used to think that the males found these holes without being able to feel anything, because they assumed the bulbs evolved from claws which don't have nerves. But recently, science hippies figured out they come from something behind the claw, so they can feel, and the spiders are like, yeah, duh. Anyways, once he finds those holes, he sort of injects his sperm into the spermatheci, on top of whatever other sperm might be up there. Whoever is last has the best shot at fertilizing the eggs. When it's all over, it's time for the male to make a quick escape, lest he become a late evening snack. Females can store sperm until they're ready to lay eggs. The sperm isn't active during that time. Instead, clusters of sperm are held inside of these little balls called coenospermia. This seems to be protection against drying out. But when the female is ready to lay her eggs, the outer membranes of these balls break and release the individual sperm. They then uncoil and are ready for the fertilization party. The female constructs a little silk nappy on the ground called an egg sac. It will provide a sterile, insulated environment for her babies. Some species embed their urticating hairs into the egg sac, which provides a bit of extra protection against parasites. Once this layer is done, she deposits her eggs quickly and carefully. The eggs are surrounded by a fluid that will be absorbed in the first hour of development. Depending on the species, she will lay anywhere from a handful of eggs to thousands. She then begins to lay down another layer of silk, gently and precisely making a soft and sterile silk home for all her future little babies. I mean, it's a little weird. You know, I mean, she basically sewed her children into a bean bag, and then she drags that around. You know, excuse me, madam, what you got there? Oh, it's a dirty pillow stuffed with your babies? I mean, that's a phone call to protective services. And I'll tell you, some of them get frogs to babysit. And you know you can't trust a frog.